The Alabama Farmers Federation and the Alabama Farmers Cooperative proudly present Simply Southern with your hosts, Jim Allen and Mary Johnson. Hello and thanks for joining us today for Simply Southern. I'm Jim Allen. And I'm Mary Johnson. Coming up, new and improved are words we hear a lot in commercials. But a man you might recognize says he's developed a new breed of cattle that grows better in our southern climate. I did a lot of research over about four years and we wanted a maternal cow for the south that was slick haired, red, um, heat, uh, adapted to our heat and humidity would be the first requirement. We'll take you to a North Alabama farm to meet a woman who's combined her love of agriculture with her love of art. For my husband, it's farming. When he doesn't farm, he is not, <laughs> he's not pleasant to be around. And so when I haven't paid it in a while, it's the same thing for me. Plus, Sidney Phelps of Bonnie Plants has a basket full of herbs from the garden that he'll use to make a Greek marinade. But to get us started today, we'll visit an Opelika business that's found a way to capture the spirit of state pride in, well, spirits. We're continually searching for, you know, ingredients that we can actually source from Alabama. And over a period of time, we'll, we'll get there. What we eat, what we wear, it all starts somewhere. And if it's good, it usually starts with a farmer. And that somewhere is right here in Alabama. In a field, in a barn, on a tractor, right now, there's a farmer starting something good for all of us. And it all starts right here in Alabama. There's no such thing as downtime when you own a farm. This is your land. You tend it and try to get the most from it, no matter the weather or time of day. It's been that way for generations. And for generations, your local quality co-op store has been there for you. With a full range of agriculture supplies and services, from feed to fertilizer, seed to grain storage, and the right hardware for any application, you'll always find what you need. Plus friendly, knowledgeable advice at your local quality co-op store. There's one near you. It was a decorative plastering business that took Montgomery's father and son duo, John and Jimmy Sharp, to exotic locations across the globe. But when Jimmy's wife had their first child, they decided they needed jobs closer to family. So the avid home brewers looked into an emerging business, craft distilling. While Opelika may be less exotic than their old business trips to Rio de Janeiro and the like, the city is the perfect fit for the Sharps' new company, John Emerald Distilling. On the northwest side of the railroad that cuts Opelika in half, John and Jimmy Sharp have transformed an old cotton warehouse into a thriving business for thirsty visitors. Three years ago, the father and son started pumping out vodka, rum, and gin from their new craft distillery, John Emerald Distilling, which showcases their strong family ties. Well, we thought because the future of our family was one of the main reasons we decided to go ahead and do it, we looked at the past of our family to name it. So John Emerald is my grandfather's first and middle name, and then each product is named after a different ancestor. Hugh Wesley's gin is named for Jimmy's great-grandfather. Gene Spiced Rum is named for his maternal grandfather. And Elizabeth Vodka, named in honor of Jimmy's great-grandmother. My understanding, all of them will be happy except my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Sharp, that she, may, she was a bit of a teetotaler, I think, and so she may be a little yeah. torqued off, maybe we'll say. <laughs> Since opening a few years ago, they've added an aged rum and an Alabama single malt whiskey. They also distribute a silver rum on a limited basis and are planning a seasonal release of Leslie's Muscadine Brandy later this year. Why so many options from just one distiller? Our license, our state license, only allows us to sell in the tasting room what we make. So in order to have a variety of products in the tasting room and have a lot of different cocktails available and those kind of things, uh, we went ahead and, and made extra products, seven different products. Along with being made in Alabama, John and Jimmy strive to include Alabama-grown products in their spirits. Rum, by law, has to be made with sugar cane. So we use sugar cane syrup from Joe Todd Syrup Farm down in Headland, Alabama. And uh, Joe's, uh, I think you know Joe, Joe's a fantastic guy, quite frankly, and really makes a good cane syrup. They forage for Alabama juniper berries to use in their gin, and they're working with North Alabama farmers to find a barley variety that can grow in the state's heat and humidity while still producing a superior tasting whiskey. 
they're already running malting tests on a batch of Alabama-grown barley. If we get one that makes a good whiskey, then the end game would be that we'd go to an Alabama farmer, say, grow me a year's worth of this barley, and we'd be a, it would be a 100% malted or, uh, Alabama product at that point in time. We're continually searching for you know, ingredients that we can actually source from Alabama. And over a period of time, we'll, we'll get there. The public is welcome to visit John Emerald Distilling, whether it's to enjoy a cocktail made by one of their mixologists, or for a tour and tasting flight on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. They also host special events from fall through spring, including concerts and wedding rehearsal dinners. I think it adds a bit of tourism. It adds, you know, like, say a point of pride for the people that live here to say, hey, we got, look, we got a distillery, you come check it out, that kind of thing. And, and, and we love being that for people. We, we, and, that, and, that, and we're excited to see people have that reaction to it. We probably average about 100 people a weekend uh, that we give tours to, roughly. And I would estimate half of those aren't from the town. While many out-of-towners come for tours and tastings, the Sharps have been overwhelmed by the warm reception of Opelika residents. Downtown Opelika has gone through an unbelievable renaissance, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, when you come down here on Friday and Saturday night, you can't get a parking spot. The, 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 the community really supports the downtown, so it's, it's, it's really a destination. It's a nice place, and we're part of that. We make it more, a more of a destination as well. And John said it's an even better destination when folks remember to enjoy in moderation. Really, what makes me the happiest is to see folks uh, enjoying our product responsibly and uh, uh, go somewhere and they said, I've had it and I like it, you know, that kind of thing. It makes you feel good. To learn how to really make all of the spirits that they have at John Emerald Distilling, the Sharps got to go to school. So they had a vodka school, a rum school, and a whiskey school that they attended. Well, if I'd gone to those classes, I would have stayed awake. And you know, you might have even been the head of the class in those schools. I could have, could have. Coming up next, agriculture feeds and clothes the world, but it can also inspire the imagination. We're going from farm to canvas when Simply Southern continues. How do you show love? With the big things? The little things? The tough things? You're everything. Show them you care. Alpha Insurance. Support healthy food from local farmers by purchasing a Farming Feeds Alabama license plate. The TAG funds education and promotion efforts, including Ag in the Classroom, agricultural scholarships, and youth programs. Get your Ag Tag today. Alabama soybean farmers help fuel the state's economy. Soybeans are used to make clean, renewable biodiesel and are a key ingredient in feed for poultry, catfish, and livestock. Soybeans are used in dozens of products we use every day. But best of all, soybean farmers generate $258 million and more than 4,000 jobs for Alabama's economy, all while helping conserve our natural resources. Explore the power of soy. Farmers from across the state commonly share how privileged they are to see the beauty of God's creation growing in their fields and pastures every day. Throughout history, these same images have inspired the art world as well. Classic painters like Van Gogh and Edward Hopper are examples of countless painters around the world who have captured the beauty of agriculture in their works. As Samantha Carpenter found out from a North Alabama woman, when you live on a farm, inspiration is always just outside your door. The North Alabama town of Elkmont, like many of our state's small communities, is tucked away amongst thousands of acres of farmland, and they're proud of it. It's often said that farming isn't a job, it's a way of life. And for local artist Heather Maples, that way of life is where she finds her inspiration. Agriculture is universal and we all need it. And, and so I think artists um, specifically can, can appreciate beauty in all different aspects. And so when they see farm animals or they see a beautiful sunset over a field, they get that and they want to translate into something that other people can appreciate on the same level that they do. Agriculture comes to life off Heather's paintbrush for good reason. It's not just her art, it's her life. 
My dad has um, a small uh, calf replacement operation, so I kind of got, got to watch him, you know, work the cattle and, and things like that. And then, of course, I married Ben, so then um, I upgraded into a larger cattle operation. <laughs> I run my studio out of my house. Um, pretty much, I just wanted to focus on rural, rural scenes, um, things that have influenced my life, just watching Ben work the cattle every day and things like that. Heather's Black Cow Art Studio takes its name from her husband's family cattle operation, and you'll find a colorful cast of barnyard residents amongst the variety of work she does. I like to paint headshots of, of livestock, so whether it's you know cattle or horses or goats, uh, you name it, sometimes I just like to do that because um, it's a release for me. I don't have to think about it, I just get to paint. About 90% of, of my work is all custom, usually just because it's easier for me to paint something that I already know somebody wants <laughs> than it is for me to come up with something and, and hope they want to buy it. Um, so a lot of my work is custom and people just contact me with um, typically pet portraits. Splitting time between helping around the farm, raising two small daughters, and catching up on custom orders with her studio, finding time to paint for herself is often limited. But when her muse is practically her own backyard, new ideas are always ready and waiting. You see a a calf with with a cow and it's just the feeling it provokes it's just it's motherhood and it's nature and it's beautiful and so just normal everyday scenes like that are ones that really kind of catch my eye and want to get me back to the canvas there's been one scene that I keep seeing and and I love because it's unique and I haven't noticed it before um, but there's these white birds that typically I've seen in Florida and they're, they're out here with the cows. And so they, they land on them and they pick the, the bugs off of them and they just like to flock and fly around the cattle. And it's so pretty just seeing the black cattle against these stark white birds. As a business or just a quiet personal retreat, painting has been as important to Heather's life as the farming world she's grown up in. Being able to combine the two is not only personally fulfilling, it's something that she gets to share with the world whenever she puts that framed canvas on the wall. I don't have an option, I have to paint. I have to get it out. If I don't do it, <laughs> then I start to kind of shrivel up and, and go away. For my husband, it's farming. When he doesn't farm, he is not, <laughs> he's not pleasant to be around. And so when I haven't painted in a while, it's the same thing for me. It's just, it, it's just something that God's put in me and I just gotta do it. And I don't question that, I just, I just know that I like the feeling that it gives me. When I go out and, and I'm, I'm in nature and I'm around the, the animals and, and I get to see my family work the land, like I said, just lights that fire and it gives me the inspiration to try to give back and, and share, share the gift that he's given me with other people. I appreciate his glory and how beautiful things are and then I can share that with other people. Heather does sell some of her work through a few art retailers in North Alabama. But the easiest way to see her work is on her Facebook page. Look her up at Black Cow Art Studios. And you'll find a lot of great pieces on there. She's also very active in the Young Farmers for the state of Alabama, part of the couple that won the Excellence in Ag Award last year. She's a busy lady. Yes, I don't know how they have enough time to do what they do up there. Now when Simply Southern continues, they say if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. But what if you develop a better breed of cattle? We'll find out right after this break. One out of four Alabama residents have benefited from the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. Last year, Master Gardener Managed Gardens donated $150,000 worth of fruits and vegetables to food banks and over 25,000 young people developed math, science, technology, and engineering skills through 4-H. Now what we want to know is, how can we help you? Seriously? Have some respect. Pick it up, man. Did you just litter? Take pride in your school. Pick it up, man. Clean it up, dude. Besides keeping your campus clean, adopt a mile with Roadside Cleanup. Attend the next Coastal Cleanup Day or pitch in on the annual Spring Cleanup Campaign. Make a difference by picking up litter and... Don't jump it on Alabama! Alabama wheat and feed grain farmers grow food, fuel, and freedom. Their harvest helps feed Alabama's multi-million dollar livestock, catfish, and poultry industries 
while reducing America's dependence on foreign countries for energy and food. By combining their strength with farmers of other commodities, feed grain growers are fueling the economic growth of Alabama communities. Nothing brings the family together like U.S. farm-raised catfish. American catfish farmers are dedicated to producing a premium, healthy catfish with a consistently mild, sweet flavor. Because we take as much pride in our work as you do in your cooking. From our family farms to your family's table, you can be sure you're getting the highest quality fish because your family deserves the best. U.S. farm-raised catfish. When you hear the word South Pole, you likely think of little black and white penguins in a frigid place. But pole, P-O-L-L, -L, is a cattle term that means without horns. And a famous Alabamian has developed a new breed of polled cattle that thrive not in the sub-zero temperatures at the bottom of the world, but in the high heat and humidity here in the South. Kevin Worthington tells us about them. There's an old flame burning in your eyes. You're probably familiar with Teddy Gentry as part of the country supergroup Alabama. Well, for over 40 years, he and his cousins, Randy Owen and Jeff Cook, topped the music charts. But while music was Gentry's job, agriculture was always his passion. Between 1989 and 2000, he developed a new breed of cattle on the northeast Alabama farm he grew up on and later bought from his grandfather. We just felt like there wasn't a breed out there that could do everything we needed done to, to have a tender piece of uh, grass-fed beef out of the south. Uh, so we started putting together a composite breed and I did a lot of research over about four years and we wanted a maternal cow for the south that was slick-haired red, um, he uh, adapted to our heat and humidity would be the first requirement. And then a, a smaller cow that was very efficient off of grass, could raise a good calf off of grass um, and breed back uh, and, and do that for many years. Because fertility and longevity is, is the, the number one and number two money makers in the cow-calf cow business. It took more than 10 years, but Gentry developed the South Pole breed with slick red hair and weighing about a thousand pounds each. They're only about two thirds of the size of most of the cattle you see around here. But he says they're bred to thrive in the Southern climate, whereas other breeds that originated in England are not. If they hit June, July, August in our environment and they have hair and they're stressed, they can't perform. They cut back on their milk. They won't cycle and breed back like they should. We gotta have our cows that are adapted first of all, and then they gotta be fertile. Andy Sumners and his dad raised cattle and chickens only about an hour from Gentry's farm. They were so impressed with the breed that they completely changed their operation. All the cattle is registered South Pole cattle on our farm. We had some Black Angus herd when we first started back in 06. We started with 20 head of South Pole and um, we gradually built that up uh, to where we're at now and we gradually worked our way out of the Black Angus business and uh, now we're full South Pole. Since the breed was developed around the year 2000, other producers across the South have made the same decision. In June, more than 200 of them gathered near Albertville for the South Pole Grass Cattle Association's annual meeting. The smaller frame, the heat tolerant, a lot of folks are seeing that, that the 1100 pound cow would produce just the same weight of a calf as an 1800 pound cow, and she eats less. She does well in this heat that we have, and humidity and heat today is going to be terrible. Uh, these cattle, where a lot of them you'll see in the ponds or under the shade tree setting down, these cattle will be out grazing um, most of the day. And uh, that's what we like about them. But the animal is only half the South Pole's secret to success. Producers say careful management is what makes these animals more productive than the traditional breeds. But ultimately, the measure of success on the farm is profitability, and South Pole producers believe their breed gives them the best return on their investment. The demand for South Pole females right now cannot be met. There's just not enough to go around, so the, um, the prices are staying up. We're, we're a good bit above commercial cattle prices right now, at least a 15-20% premium on cattle prices. It's a money-making opportunity for people that are wanting to make a living we feel that the South Pole offer, offers the most profit per acre of any cow out there. For Simply Southern, I'm Kevin Worthington. 
We usually think bigger is better, but who would have thought that a smaller animal had the potential to be more profitable? More information is available at South Pole, that's spelled P-O-L-L, dot com. I've been on Teddy Gentry's farm. The cattle aren't that tall, but they are solid muscle. Yes, and Teddy Gentry has even written a book about the breed he developed. It's called Before You Have a Cow. So this really has all the information that you could ever want to know about raising South Pole cattle. A lot of stuff in that book. Mm -hmm. When Simply Southern continues, Sidney Phelps from Bonnie Plants is in the kitchen today. He's gonna show you how to make a Greek marinade with herbs from the garden. What sustains us? Food, family, faith. Alabama farmers live those things every day. They conserve our resources, clothe our families, and fill our tables. They cultivate jobs for our communities and values for our future. Farmers grow it all right here in Alabama. There's nothing quite like sitting down to a home-cooked meal with fresh vegetables from the garden. With Bonnie Plants from your local quality co-op store, you can enjoy the freshest vegetables right from your own backyard. And no matter if you're a raised bed gardener, a rose gardener, or if you farm hundreds of acres, your quality co-op store has exactly what you need to get the most out of your plants. You'll always find what you need, plus friendly, knowledgeable advice at your local quality co-op store. There's one near you. For more Simply Southern, be sure to follow us on social media. And while you're online, visit our website, simplysoutherntv.net. Simply Southern will continue in a moment. FFA makes a positive difference in the lives of students by developing their potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. We're strengthening American agriculture and providing our members with the skills needed to build healthy local communities, a strong nation, and a sustainable world. We are the next generation of agriculture. It's our turn now. Let's show the world what we can achieve together. We, we are FFA. FFA. We believe a plant should be more than a plant. This one is, it's all you need for your garden to succeed because it's a Bonnie plant. It represents hundreds of varieties of Bonnie's quality veggies and herbs. But more, it's from generations of Bonnie people who are passionate about sharing their love of gardening with you. Look for this little Bonnie plant and a whole family of plants like it in your garden center, Bonnie Plants, so you'll know how to grow. Hey folks, Sydney Phelps here with Bonnie Plants. Today we're in the kitchen and we're gonna work on a Mediterranean style marinade. So this is something that's very popular in Greek, uh, Italian dishes, and what we basically got today is we have fresh harvested Greek oregano out of the garden. We've got some lemon thyme uh, to add an extra little bit of flavor. We've got a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of diced red onion, uh, about seven or eight cloves of garlic. In Mediterranean food, garlic is probably one of the more prominent um, flavors that you, you get. It's very bold, it's very, um, uh, it seeps in when it comes to marinades very heavily. And then we've also got some lemons, uh, a couple of cloves of garlic here just showing you uh, what you're working with uh, when you get it. You want to buy fresh garlic, that's the key when you're working with this. But we'll start off with our oregano. So we've pulled this oregano up out of our garden, out of containers that I've got outside here. And the best way to do this is just to strip it. So we want to go the opposite way, just take your thumb and pull it. So that's going to get all the leaves and everything off. You don't want the stalks. So we're going to break all these leaves right off, get us a nice little pile here. We're going to do the same thing with the lemon thyme. Uh, the lemon thyme basically just adds more of a citrus flavor. We're already going to have orange juice uh, and lemon juice in there, but the thyme having that herb uh, feature in there just makes it a little bit better. So get these out of the way. Uh, we're going to get all these pushed together. So we're basically working to have uh, about a little bit of about a half cup to a full cup of uh, leaves. So same thing with lemon times. These are going to be a little bit tighter. Get those pulled off. Mix them in with the oregano. And we're going to do a coarse chop on it. So basically when we're dealing with a coarse chop, we want to just get them. They're going to go into the food processor. But we're going to take our blade and just get a good coarse chop across the oregano. 
get everything kind of mixed in there together. And when you're working with food processors or blenders, you always want to start off with your dry ingredients first. So I've got a small food processor here, and we're going to start by getting our dry ingredients. So our herbs go in the bottom. That's going to allow them to get around the blades a little bit better. Like I said, we're going to add the quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of diced onion. We're going to throw in the cloves of garlic and just kind of put them around and then an orange juice. I've got a cup of uh, fresh orange juice. It's got some pulp in it, so that's gonna add even more flavor, and that's gonna give us something to work around uh, with the herbs. So I've got one lemon here. I'm gonna cut in half. Just gonna take a fork, get all the lemon juice in there. So juice of a lemon, the pulp is fine. And get that in there. And we're going to start this up. When you get the marinade, you want it to work down really well. And you're going to basically put it up. You can freeze this, keep it overnight. But we want to run it to a very nice uh, uh, viscosity. So we're going to do this. Once everything's broken down, put it back in there. You're good to go. If you want to find these recipes, you can go to bonnieplants.com and check them out there. Any other questions that you have, go to uh, Homegrown for Bonnie Plants on the App Store. Thanks again. If you have a gardening question, drop Sydney an email at simplysouthern at alifarm.com and he may answer it on an upcoming show. You can also go to their website for gardening tips, recipes, and much more. If it's about gardening, it's at bonnieplants.com. We're out of time for today, folks. Thanks for watching. Next week on Simply Southern, we're going to a festival in South Alabama that celebrates one of the greatest musicians, not only in Alabama, but the world. And we're going to school in the classroom of Alabama's Teacher of the Year. But before we go, here are links to some of the stories we featured today. I'm Mary Johnson. And I'm Jim Allen. We'll see you again here next week. Simply Southern is a production of the Alabama Farmers Cooperative and the Alabama Farmers Federation.